the Zulu language, when you greet someone, you do so by saying, Sawabona. This means, I see you. And the colloquialized response is, Yebo, Sawabona, meaning, I see you too. The way we interact with the internet, we often don't acknowledge that when we're looking at it, it's looking back at us. But the searches we make and the decisions we do through clicking create a data pattern, a footprint. And when we stand back and we look at this data on mass, it tells us something about you and it tells us something about myself. Behind me, you can see a chart which shows the volume of data points we're looking at when we're creating this reflection of humanity. Google operates 1.2 trillion searches a year, 40,000 a second. That's 35,000 gigabytes of data moving every moment. And those gigabytes of data tell us a lot. And they're going to get more. We're going to have more of these gigabytes over time. But just looking at them in individual points doesn't tell us an awful lot. But when we start to look at them in terms of categories and subjects, we see a very interesting picture of humanity starting to form. We see a prevailing interest in love, topping the search engines every year. We find an obsession with cats, only really rivaled by that of bacon. We also see that Adele is not only the most popular artist in the world, but in fact, one of the most popular people. But it's not these data points individually that are super interesting. It's when we look at them in terms of themes and topics comparatively that we see even more. When we look at the search volume for Star Wars last year, we see that it completely dwarfed that of interest in Cecile the Lion and further that of the Iran nuclear deal by an almost frightening amount. And when we stand back and we look at all of these trends, what we're starting to see is that quite largely human interest is driven by emotion, trivial notions, and sensation quite a lot of the time. Google's mission is to organize the world's information, make it accessible to all of us. And it does this through tracking these same data points and creating an algorithm to serve up this information. Now, when we look at this algorithm, we see three key characteristics. It's designed for efficiency. It watches us. It learns from us. It learns what we do and don't like, what we consider a good result. And then it serves up the most popular website for that query. Secondly, we know that we can create our own environments. We can like pages. We have Gmail logins. It knows who we're connected to. It looks at what we previously purchased. And then thirdly, we notice that a lot of this happens invisibly to you and me, to consumers en masse. But there is a whole industry out there that understands and employs this knowledge, and they're called search engine optimization specialists. This means that the information you're receiving is designed and structured by humans and algorithms. So what does this tell us? Well, to me, it says that human beings are driven by quite a lot of trivial notions. And we will follow these trivial patterns and trends almost without restraint if given half a chance. But also, the hope and the potential for the internet seems to be somewhat in conflict with how we use and operate and explore it. And this is perpetuated by the technology that we have built to serve up this information. We've almost created an opiate of information delivery. Now, algorithms track data about us, and they almost justify our own intuitions. So you may think that when you go online, you're exploring a wider pool, and you are. But this wider pool is encapsulated in a bubble, essentially serving up trends, popularity. So you're essentially fishing in a pool of popularity. 
As such, this forms encapsulating self-growing bubbles. And these bubbles form a self-perpetuating zeitgeist that can keep us captive and reinforce some of these negative patterns. So when you take this idea of designing your own environment and you couple it with algorithmic technology, you create what we call filter bubbles. And these were coined by Elie Parisier. And these don't just exist in search. We find that these exist in publishing. If you go onto any major news website and you look at the most popular searches, you will find the same trends featuring alongside really important topics. So in a sense, although we have freedom of the press legally, we may not have it algorithmically. And search experts were asked recently, do they think that these self-designed environments are a form of censorship? 75% said yes. They serve up big brands over small brands because they know that's what we normally like. And when it comes to looking at job-based queries, we self-perpetuate gender divides. If you look at searches for nurse jobs, they will all be female, plumbers, predominantly male. And then something interesting happens when we look at grammatically incorrect queries, such as how come or why are. What you find is that people with bad grammar are going to be trapped in different bubbles to those with good grammar. So what does this all mean? Well, to me, it means that the first impressions that we get are largely sculpted by search results. And over time, we could find things that are different being perceived as dangerous. And we start to construct a vision of reality that isn't a true reflection of it. Now, you can turn off personalization. You can even get around some of the geo-tracking to somewhat numb these bubbles. But you cannot turn off what these algorithms have already learned about everybody else's searches. And you can't turn it off in social media. These algorithms are becoming the equivalent of creating new drugs, serving up ideas that are so hard to resist, and they're getting stronger, and they're getting more addictive, and they're getting that way faster. It used to be only online data that was tracked, but now, when you go into a shopping center and you log on to their Wi-Fi, they drop a cookie quite often onto your phone, and then they track all your offline data as well. So we're perpetuating and growing these bubbles with off and online data now. And Google used to reject the idea of machine learning, but it's since changed its stance on this, which means over time, it could be self-learning and growing these at an excessive rate. And these are only two examples of how these are growing. This all serves to essentially scale and amplify this opiate and these bubbles. So what does this mean? Well, it means that new ideas, new solutions, new opportunities that don't fit the current impulsive paradigm and pattern that we have have a huge barrier to break through. Getting into popularity is just going to get increasingly harder. Researchers are already under immense pressure right now to create sexy research. And it affects the type of technology that gets investment and support. For example, if you look at Kickstarter and the top tech projects that got funded last year, it correlates quite directly to the search volume of particular terms. And this isn't just present in crowdfunding technology. We see it in the traditional investment model as well. We find that VCs used to be quite disparate geographically and online, whereas now they're working within very tightly closed bubbles, reading the same information, which means they're investing in very similar projects. Our ability to change has always underpinned our survival of our species. We need to be adaptive in order to cope not locked in a bubble dominated by trivial notions, sensation, and emotion. Free, spontaneous development of the internet does not get us to a healthy balance between growth and pleasure. 
the current systems, processes, and algorithms, and the manner in which we interact with them, alongside the velocity and the invisible nature of these algorithms, is becoming threatening. So what do we do? Well, we need to embrace the idea that we live in bubbles. They help us. They guide us. They accelerate our knowledge and our understanding and our connections in lots of areas. However, the current organization and the system of them is based on comfort and similarity. And we should be able to choose different bubbles that are completely opposite to our existing ones. An alternative solution might be to craft an algorithm based on dissimilarity. And this could have a whole portfolio of different logic behind it. And some people are already working on serendipitous algorithms, although the idea is somewhat oxymoronic by its very nature. Social media provides a different set of bubbles, but again, it falls prey to exactly the same thing as the search algorithms do. And Google has something that it calls an accuracy algorithm. And this is for really important queries relating to finance, politics, and medical issues. And what it aims to do is serve up the most trustworthy website as opposed to the most popular one. So if you're looking for the links between autism and vaccines, it will put what it considers to be the most trustworthy site highest. It also cleanses certain queries that it doesn't like, that it considers to be somewhat offensive. We see this in politics. We see it with religious queries as well. And then there are websites like DuckDuckGo, and this is a search engine that doesn't track anything about you, or a million short. And this wipes out the first million websites for any search query. But it's not quite enough to wipe out the first million websites. That doesn't fully solve the problem. When we're approaching this problem, we need to accept that we don't always want to grow. We don't always want to learn. We may want to have fun. We may want to be impulsive. And actually, research by Yahoo and Microsoft confirms this. When they tried to disrupt the search experience, users didn't like it. So we need to look at designing a system that makes users want to explore, makes you want to grow a system that helps human nature, not just services, and in some ways abuses it. This is in part a systemic challenge, because the danger in it is systemic. So perhaps the solution is a mixture of conscious effort combined with system change. We need to be conscious that we live in bubbles, that our on and our offline world sculpt them. And we need to consider that an efficient answer isn't always a healthy answer. The internet is the landscape of our future. If we can solve this problem, we can invert an element of human nature and harness the acceleration of these bubbles for the greater good of humanity. Thank you. <laughs>